Welcome back to another episode of the CSK8 podcast. My name is Jared O'Leary. This week, I'm going to be unpacking some scholarship. In particular, I'm going to be building off of what I kind of talked about two weeks ago with the article that was discussing different categories of questions or types of questions. And I'm going to talk about some questions in some makerspaces. The way I'm going to do so is I'm going to unpack an article about using questions within a makerspace. Now, makerspaces and maker culture is pretty relevant to CS education. Uh, as you'll have noticed in many of the podcast interviews that, ha that have been appearing on the show, many of the guests have talked about informal learning or rhizomatic learning or just learning in general that is not linear. A part of maker culture and maker practices often is the idea that learning is not linear or kind of goes in several different directions, or at least can. So for this episode and the next two episodes, I'm gonna talk a little bit about maker culture and maker practices as they kind of relate to CS education. So today's article is by Leanne Bowler and Ryan Champagne. Sorry if I mispronounce any names, but the title is called, quote, Mindful Makers, colon, question prompts to help guide young people's critical technical practices in maker spaces, in libraries, museums, and community-based youth organizations, end quote pretty long title. Okay, so here's the actual abstract from the paper itself. Quote, this study examines question prompts as a mean to scaffold reflection and reflexivity in the design, development, and use of technical artifacts in makerspaces for youth at public libraries, museums, and community-based organizations. Qualitative analysis is applied to data gathered in four focus groups with teens, three semi-structured interviews with adults who facilitate makerspaces, and six observation sessions. Outcomes include a rich description of critical thinking in the context of technology practice. And secondly, a set of eight activation questions that serve as a toolkit to encourage reflection and scaffold mindful and critical practices in community-based makerspaces for youth. Results from the study support the development of instruments and practices to support mindful making and critical technical practice in makerspaces for youth. End quote. All right, so if I were to actually summarize this paper in one sentence, I'd go with the author's description at the very beginning of the abstract, which is, this study examines question prompts as a means to scaffold reflection and reflexivity in the design, development, and use of technological artifacts in makerspaces for youth at public libraries, museums, and community-based organizations. I think that's actually an excellent one sentence summary of this particular publication. And as a friendly reminder, if you're interested in actually reading this publication and seeing other articles published by any of the authors mentioned in the show, you can simply go to jaredoleary.com and click on the show notes for this episode, or just go into your podcast app and click on the show notes there, and it should take you directly to it. So again, all of the author names will take you to the Google Scholar profile, and then the actual title for the paper, when you click on that, it'll take you to the paper itself. So the authors begin by kind of posing the question of whether and how critical thinking practices might occur within a makerspace with, for young kids. Whenever you hear me talking about the questions that are in here and mention makerspaces, just think of how you might be able to consider applying some of these within your computer science classroom or your classroom that happens to integrate computer science. So here's a quote from page 117. The question prompt is a verbal tool that can reveal variables associated with self-regulation, self-awareness, reflection, and reflexivity, opening a window of thought processes during the making process. Question prompts can also, if skillfully applied, provide a metacognitive scaffold to help steer novice makers towards a critical technical practice in makerspaces, end quote. So in other words, if kids are thinking through some of the question prompts that are posed within this particular publication, the authors suggest that this might actually help kids think a little bit more critically about what they're creating in a classroom. Now, one of the things that I really appreciated in this particular article is that the authors pose a lot of questions throughout the article itself. So I've included a list of some of those questions to consider in the show notes, and hopefully this kind of will serve as a teaser to read the full article itself, which is definitely worth looking into more. Okay, so in the literature review, when they're discussing maker movement, here are a few quotes on page 118 that kind of summarize what the maker movement is. So quote, Maker spaces, places for work and play that foster inventive production and expression in a communal environment, offer individuals opportunities to experiment with digital and analog technologies as conduits for creation and essential learning, end quote. So that actually sounds a lot like the coding classes that I used to facilitate in grades K through eight and what we um, encourage people to do in the professional development that we provide through the nonprofit that I work for, Boot Up PD. Here's another quote from 118. Quote, Makerspaces embody making, sharing, giving, learning, tooling up, 
playing, participating, supporting, and changing, end quote. So in other words, there's a lot of creativity and diverse ways of engagement going on within the class itself. Now, the authors also suggest that makerspaces can kind of be described as multidisciplinary, which is a, a common phrase used among maker culture, which is often described by curriculum scholars as interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary, as multidisciplinary means something else in curriculum scholarship. And that's generally speaking there. If you want to actually read more about that, my dissertation kind of unpacks the different ways that uh, different fields related to education talk about multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary, integrated, etc. But that's just me talking nerdy right now, so I'm going to get off that, that soapbox. Now, one of the things that I, is a kind of a big part about maker cultures is this following quote from also on page 118. It's quote, production offers value beyond an end product for makers. They develop new literacies by engaging with tools and processes that may not surface in conventional learning environments, end quote. So a big part about maker practices in general is that the process is extremely valued. And this is also kind of one of the things that is also valued in constructivism or constructionism as well, is that it's the process in, of engaging with or creating some kind of a computer science or coding project or anything in general that is more valuable than what is created itself in terms of uh, learning. So that's kind of their overview of the maker movement within education in their literature view. They also discuss other areas such as critical technical practice, which is the lens they use for analyzing the data that I'll discuss in a little bit. And then they kind of provide a short summary of scholarship on mindful making and its relationship with education agendas, metacognition, interpersonal knowledge, and deeper learning. So if you're interested in reading more scholarship about that, check out this review of literature at the start of this particular publication. Okay, so this study actually looks at three after-school makerspace programs in Pittsburgh. Here's a quote from page 120. Quote, in total, 29 teens participated in the focus group, the numbers depending on attendance in the program on that day. Throughout the research project, approximately 45 teens, six adult mentors, and six administrative staff members were engaged with during the course of this research project. End quote. So data was actually collected in spring of 2014 uh, over six different observations, four focus groups with the teens, and then three semi-structured interviews with the adult mentors that participated in this particular project. Now, the actual analysis or theoretical lens that was used for this is called critical technical practice. And on page 118, they describe it as, quote, Critical technical practice questions our assumptions about how people interact with technology and emphasizes the role that designers have in mediating that interaction, end quote. Now to elaborate on it, here's another quote from the same page, quote, CTP suggests that the process of making a technological artifact can be a political act with social consequences that impact not just the maker and final end user, but also larger society. The suggestion being that makers who are unaware of themselves as actors in the making process are, in some way, working blind, end quote. So the basic idea of looking at CTP, critical technical practice, and the questions that are kind of asked is to get kids to kind of understand that, one, they are or can be makers, and two, the things that they make can have an impact on society. Now, as a general note, the mentors within the makerspace tried to avoid becoming a crutch for the kids who participated in it. So rather than answering questions directly or kind of giving lectures on how to do stuff, they would often respond to questions by encouraging makers to figure out things on their own or by asking some more questions to kind of guide them through this. So this kind of relates to the approaches that have been mentioned in some of the interviews. And then two weeks ago, the Unpacking Scholarship episode where I kind of talk about some different questioning techniques, the open, guided, closed, analytical, judicial, and creative questions as well. So on page 120 and 121, they have a list of some questions that were intended to stimulate deeper thinking and critical practices through the maker processes that CS educators might actually be able to use in their classroom. So the questions are, what will make me happy? Who is my audience? What resources do I have and need? What will inspire me to give my time and effort to a project? What do I know? Can I let myself make a mistake? How will my creation affect other people? And what kind of maker am I? Okay, so let's kind of unpack each one of those, both in terms of what the authors have for implications and then how this might relate to computer science education. So the first one, what will make me happy? According to the teens in the study, the heart of making processes is having fun or engaging in some kind of a pleasurable experience related to making within that space. 
So that is something that I really tried to focus on in the classes that I was working with. So the K-8 coding classes that I designed and facilitated in Avondale, Arizona, they, they were mandated by all the kids in the school. So several hundred kids were forced to be in a classroom that they may or may not have an interest in. So my goal was to try and find some way to make this process in an engaging and fun experience for everybody who was required to be there. Now, this is an approach that I've mentioned before in interviews that is different than how I might approach a class where kids are opting to be there. So like when I have facilitated elective courses or even graduate courses at the university level where people are paying to be there, I know there's some kind of a buy-in inherently with either the course topic itself or the broader degree topic as a whole. So I don't have to think about this as much as a course that is forced on a kid who might not have any kind of interest in computer science or coding to begin with. Now, the second question, who is my audience? So I think this is an excellent question to think through to kind of get at some of the standards, like the CSTA's standards or even uh, ISTE's standards that are on thinking through diverse perspectives and end users when creating or making some kind of a product or artistic expression. So for example, thinking through how someone who is deaf might engage with a project that has a lot of sounds or music. Now the next question, what resources do I have and need? So this is a good question to think through in terms of like the constraints are important to consider, like what kind of resources do I have and am, and am I limited to? So if I want to be able to create A, B, and C, but I only have X, Y, and Z for resources, I might not be able to do that. But this is also kind of a good way of thinking through inspiration. So here's a quote from page 121. It says, quote, as one teen explained, one of her first actions when launching a maker project is to look around the space and ask herself, what can I use to inspire me, end quote. So I think that's a really good way of kind of framing this in terms of affordances. Like what can this do for me and how might I create something that's interesting to me using the resources that I have available to me. Now from a computer science perspective, the resources might not just be the physical hardware that you're using within a class as is typical of many makerspaces in terms of like what kind of tools do I have and resources can I make, but also the software. So thinking through well, what kind of platforms do I have? What kind of languages do I have? And several of the past interviews on this podcast have kind of talked through that. In particular, the interview with John Stapleton kind of unpacks affordances and constraints a, a bit more. So the next question is, what will inspire me to give my time and effort to a project? Here's a quote from page 121. Makers assess the value of a project according to the balance between their knowledge and skills and the degree of meaningfulness that the project has for them. Too much interest coupled with too little knowledge might mean extra time and effort. But if the project is interesting enough, time and effort might be worth it. By asking this question, one begins to plan for engagement in the making process." End quote. Now, I think this is a really good point to take into consideration. This kind of builds off of Vygotsky's zone of proximal development or Csikszentmihalyi's idea of flow and other people who've kind of talked about things in different ways. The idea that your level of effort and energy and time that you can put into something needs to be balanced with your current abilities and how difficult it is to complete what you're working on. Having had a lot of experiences in different subject areas with this particular topic, I will say that I strongly recommend people engage in what they're interested in, even if it is more difficult than what they are currently capable of doing at the moment in terms of skills or abilities. So for example, when I worked with young musicians who were working on a piece of music that was very difficult for them, but if they're super motivated to learn that piece of music, like they just love that piece of music, and I was like, yeah, great, we'll just go really slow. And as long as you're okay with that, then I will help you through that. However, if they really liked a piece, but they weren't willing to put in the time to work on it because it was too difficult for them, then I'd usually say, well, here's how much time it's going to take to be able to play that thing really well. Are you willing to invest that amount of time into it? And then often people would say, no, let's work on something easier. So basically what I'm saying is it might help to kind of have kids think through whether or not their level of inspiration to work on something kind of matches the amount of time they're willing to put into a project or able to put into a project. So the authors mentioned that self-assessment is kind of a key part of maker practices. And the question, what do I know, is one excellent way of kind of getting at that. Now this can definitely be applied in computer science education. So for example, one of the things that I love to do was to kind of ask questions like these related to a project, whether it be through formative or ipsative assessments. So ipsative assessments is kind of like a self-reflection of understanding in relation to prior understanding. So like when a kid uh, finished a project, I'd be like, great, how does your understandings in this project compare to your prior project, et cetera? 
So if you're if you're not familiar with Ipsative, in the show notes I've got a couple of links to some resources that unpack Ipsative assessment more. So asking what do I know and engaging in those self-assessment practices can be really helpful and is something that I highly recommend. So not only are these self-assessment type of questions something that I highly value, it's actually something that I encourage in the free lesson plans that I create at bootuppd.org. You can find a link in the show notes if you're interested in, in checking those out. Again, all free, 100%. And then in the professional development at bootup. So it is really something that I strongly recommend. This is not just me paying lip service to self-assessment. It's something that we reiterate in every lesson that I create and then in the PD that we facilitate. So the next question is, can I let myself make a mistake? Yes. All right, so next question. No, just kidding. Okay, so a, a question that I might ask is, when is failure? So as an example from page 123, here's a, a question that the authors pose. Quote, if the end product isn't used in the expected manner, is it a failure? End quote. So I think questions like that are good things to think through. I mean, yes, we as computer science educators are constantly like, yes, debugging is a practice so that you're going to engage in, even if you don't want to. It's just part of engaging in computer science and, and hardware and software and whatnot. You're going to find mistakes. You're going to find bugs. You're going to find things that can be improved upon. But my question is more about like, well, when do we actually consider something to be a failure? And how can we reframe that into making it as something as a positive? So the question, how will my creation affect other people? This can be used for thinking through like a range of impact from positive through negative. So like a positive thing might be like, how might what I'm creating help somebody? Whereas a negative might be, well, how might what I create unintentionally harm someone else or another group of people? So this can relate to computer science standards that are about seeking diverse perspectives and considering other viewpoints when developing and designing accessible software and hardware. And the final question, what kind of a maker am I? So from page 123, here's the following quote. When asked to define himself as a maker, one adult mentor described a complex collection of identities rather than a single stable identity, end quote. Now, this is something that really relates to me. So on my website, if you've been to it, you'll notice that I have a comment underneath my name. It's the two slashes. It says multiplicity. So I describe myself as a multiplicity, which kind of means that I am many different identities depending on the different contexts that I'm in. And the reason why I do this is because I'm trying to point out that depending on who I'm talking to and where I'm at, I might identify as a computer science educator, or I might identify as a music educator, or I might identify as somebody who has dogs, or somebody who has a loving spouse, or somebody who plays video games. Like, there are many different things that I identify as. But to kind of, like, put it back into this context... Within a makerspace, there are so many different ways that you can engage with different practices, whether it be soldering something or coding something or sewing something or designing something or a million of other different possibilities within a makerspace. Now, this is also the case in computer science education. So yes, you might be engaging in coding practices if your class is a programming class. However, there are many different types of identities that can be associated with yourself when you are programming something. The reason why I'm emphasizing this is because there is not one way of engaging in computer science or programming, and there are many different kind of identities or ways of being that can be brought to the table when you engage in some practices that encourage kids to create things that are interesting to them, especially if you're engaging what is often referred to nowadays as culturally relevant pedagogy. And that being said, I will say that the more you kind of identify within a group or domain, the better the overall experience. At least this is from my uh, perspective and some of the scholarship on communities of practice and affinity spaces, is if you can get kids to kind of understand that one of their identities can be as a computer scientist or as a programmer, that will likely help them with their engagement in the classroom itself. All right, so those were the main prompts that they suggest asking kids within a makerspace, and they don't suggest this just like front-loading it at the beginning or uh, putting at the very end, but you can kind of ask this throughout a process. So perhaps you might consider trying some of these questions or modifying similar questions within the computer science classes that you are working with. I've got a couple of lingering questions for this particular study. One of them is, when and why are maker or inquiry-based practices encouraged or discouraged? So here's a quote from page 122. Learning in makerspaces may require a different take on the typical approach to knowing what you know. In the classic version of the inquiry process, learners begin by questioning the boundaries of their knowledge and then end with a new creation. In makerspaces, the inquiry process is inverted, turned upside down, as it were. Makers start by creating and then end with understanding. The question, what do I know, 
should be asked within the context of creating and not as a precursor to the process, end quote. So while I love this overall sentiment and approach, I do wonder where such an approach may or not be encouraged within an educational context. So for example, some administrators want to have predictable outcomes in a lesson, project, or unit, or some educators want kids to know what they're going to create before they create it. Yes, you can iterate on it, but we need to have some kind of idea what you're gonna do rather than just flying by the seat of your pants. So another question that I have is, what kind of questions or prompts might CS educators reflect upon to improve their own pedagogical practices or understandings? So this publication is more about potential questions that an adult might be able to ask a kid within an educational context. However, I'm wondering what are some of the questions that we as educators or facilitators might be able to ask ourselves to kind of further improve our own understandings. For example, perhaps engaging in a weekly, monthly, or quarterly review where you kind of think through, okay, what are some of the things that I'm trying to improve upon with my pedagogy or with my own understandings in computer science? So as an example, if you are a brand new computer science educator and you've been in the classroom for a while, you might be like, okay, how am I trying to improve my understanding of a particular language or platform that is being used in a class? Or if you're brand new to education in general and have an understanding of computer science, you might ask questions like, how might I improve student engagement within the classes that I facilitate? So thinking through some of the pedagogy. Now, I will say that as positive as these questions are and as the maker movement is discussed in many articles, including the one that we'll release two weeks from now, the article that I'm going to unpack in four weeks is actually pretty critical of maker culture discourse. So I just wanted to give you a little teaser on that because this isn't all just positive things. Maker culture isn't this like grand thing that's going to revolutionize education. There are some problematic things in terms of the discourse that we'll talk about later on. So that kind of summarizes the main points of this article and some of the main questions that you might be able to ask in relation to CS education and some of my own questions that are lingering after having read this. So as a friendly reminder, if you're interested in learning more about some of the questioning techniques, I do have a video that I created for Boot Up that is shared within the show notes for this that you can find at jaredoleary.com or by clicking the link in the description for your podcast app. Within the show notes, you'll also find a link to chapter two of my dissertation, which also summarizes more scholarship on maker culture. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Next week is going to be another interview, and then the week after that, we'll be back again with another Unpacking Scholarship episode.